Anyway, let me acknowledge some folks. Is that okay? I'm gonna acknowledge some folks. First one, Pastor Mike and Cynthia. Um, wow. How many of you know transitions aren't easy? I, I share with people all the time. It's the quote I heard. It stuck with me. Uh, transitions always feel like failure when you're in the middle of them. And I remember meeting Pastor Mike many years ago, and we were talking about the transition that was going to be happening here. And a lot of people don't make it. A lot of people don't weather transitions. They don't handle it. They tap out. You know, they're like, no, I'm done. That's it. I quit. And now, walking around here, being here, I was with the staff yesterday. Um, wow. A lot of great things have happened. And I'm sure the influence that this church and the impact it's had on your life has been substantial. Uh, it's because they weathered the transition and they did it well. And to say that I had a voice in that, that that's humbling and wonderful and awesome. But I also know that it's not just about hearing something and it being inspiring or motivating to you or insightful. You have to do the work. And Pastor Mike can say that they've done the work. It's not easy, right? These lights, it's not everybody wants to be, you know, everybody wants to speak. Everybody wants to be in the limelight. Not everybody, most people. But I'm telling you, it's tough. The lights, they produce heat. The heat, man, it'll expose things in you. And I'm telling you, they've done it well, and I'm very proud of them. So if this has impacted you at all, this family, this church, would you please be willing to give them a big, huge round of applause? <laughs> you know, say you're proud of somebody. It's like, you, you know, I'm not proud of them. I'm, I'm proud for them. Like, he's a friend. You know what I mean? Like, he's a friend. I got great relationships with great people, and Pastor Mike's a friend. I know if I need something, I call him and say, hey, man, what you think? And, and I would trust his insight. And I think we all need that. And so it's wonderful. I like seeing what I see. My family's here with me. My wife, my wife Jennifer, is here. My daughter, Addison, is here. She's sitting on the front, front row. My, my daughter, Kennedy, who's seven, is running around somewhere out here. You know what I mean? About this high. <laughs> Refuses to get taller, but she's just crushing it at, at one foot eight. That's about how tall she is. <laughs> but my family's with me. And... Um, you know, it, it's wonderful. And so seeing what all is going on, it's been great, great having them here. Uh, the second people I want to acknowledge are those of you that are sitting here. And the reason I say that need to be acknowledged is you could be anywhere. You could. You don't have to show up. You don't have to endure the cold outside. You don't have to endure other people. You don't have to endure putting a mask on. And, and this is challenging. It's been so challenging for so many people, but you're here. You're here. I think sometimes during 2020, it was like, I, I don't know if we're gonna make it. I don't know as a people if we're gonna make it. It's been crazy. Has it not been crazy? There's been a lot, but you know what? You're here. So sometimes you just need to pat yourself on the back and say, hey, we made it. We're not done, right? This ain't the end. This is the beginning, but we made it. We're here. So if you're sitting in this sanctuary right here, why don't you give yourself a round of applause? You're here, right? <laughs> you're here. And then there's people online that are watching. Those of you that are online, I wanna acknowledge you. The reason that is the case, I think that's important, is because so much now has become remote and virtual that it can kind of be overwhelming to be looking at a screen all the time. You got one in your pocket, you know? You got one in your pocket, pull it out, like screen in your face, iPads, right? Computer, work, there's screens all the time. And so sometimes, like, my, my kids will be talking to the, the in-laws or my mom and um, my sisters, and I see the camera, and they got a camera on them. They're doing FaceTime, and I'm kind of like, oh, oh, no, because I'm on a, on a camera. I'm in front of a screen all the time. That's what I do. We coach, I think it's close to 60 teams I have that I work with, that I coach half-hour sessions, 25, 30 minutes every other week. I got a screen, a computer in my face, a camera all the time. It can be a bit overwhelming. So the people watching online, you're not here physically, but you're here in spirit, we wanna give you a round of applause, because you're here, so <laughs> that's awesome. You could be watching Netflix. I don't know what you watch, right? Now you guys give me, no, I'm just kidding, you don't need to give me a round of applause. Acknowledge me, no, that's good. But there's a scripture I wanna read, no, you don't have to, please don't, please don't. No, no, you go and clap, you ain't gotta clap. Don't clap for me, I didn't do anything. I just brought the awesome. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk to you today about this scripture. It comes out of the book of Acts. It's about this guy named Peter. You guys know who Peter was? You guys know? Peter is this very outspoken, ran his mouth a lot. You guys know any Peters in your life? Any of you know anybody like that? 
How many of you have ever done that before, kind of ran your mouth, knew you didn't need to be running your mouth, said something you shouldn't have said, as soon as you said it, you wish you could take it back? How many of you are married? How many of you are married, you've done it and married, said something, and instantly were like, that was probably not going to go over good, then you kind of take it. Peter was a very powerful, powerful voice. So much that Jesus even said, hey, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. He's talking about Peter. He's talking about this, this, this voice, this this. This guy had this audacity about him. But in Scripture in Acts, it's chapter 12, starts in verse 7. If you got your Bible and you want to find it, flip through the pages there, that's great. Uh, if you're on the iPad, however it is. But I want to read you this, this passage about Peter being in prison. Because he was locked up. He was incarcerated. He, he, he was in prison. And the thing that, that I'm seeing is a lot of us, even though we may not be in the physical walls of a prison, there are certain things that have us locked up, and I think it could be just as bad. Fedor Dostoevsky is his name. He wrote a book called Crime and Punishment, and one of the things that Dostoevsky said was, he said, the easiest prison to have someone locked in and keep them there is one they don't know they're in. And I realize that in my life there could be prisons that I put myself in based on some of the things that we're gonna talk about here in just a minute. But I think all of us can lock ourselves in and we don't even know how we got there. We don't even know why we feel like we're in a prison. So I wanna talk about this, but I wanna read the passage first and I'm gonna elaborate what I, what I believe it means and hopefully it'll give you some insight on this. It's Acts chapter 12, verse seven. Here's what it says. It says, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shined in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, and he woke him up. He said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists, and the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. And it says then that he told him to wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that the angel was doing this for real. He, he didn't know if this was what was for real happening. He thought maybe it was just a vision. So as they passed the first and the second guards, they came to an iron gate leading back into the city. It opened for them by itself, and he went through it. And as he walked a distance down the street, then the angel left him. And I was reading this, I'm like, okay. I, I, I do so much corporate leadership coaching that there are certain things that I can't say. I know I can't. Sometimes I have to sign disclosures. You can't talk about Jesus. You can't talk about God. We want you to be here to help people change how they think, our bottom line. There's certain things that I can't say. And you know what? That's okay for me. That's okay. Sometimes I shouldn't have to tell people I'm a Christian. I shouldn't have to tell people what I believe. I shouldn't have to. I hope that sometimes the example of my courageousness or my audacity or how I love my family is an example for people. I don't think people really listen to our words very much. I think they look at the example more, right? And so in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, let me think about this intellectually. Like, remove it from just the spiritual realm of it being an angel. Like, pull that back a bit. Pull it back from actually being in a prison with walls. What could have us locked up like Peter was locked up. And so I started looking at it and I started breaking this down. I started saying to myself, okay, what are some things that throw us into a prison? Maybe the one like Dostoevsky said, and he said, look, it's one you don't even know you're in. So what could be some things that are a prison to us that we don't even realize have us locked up? So that's my come from today. That's the context for this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna give you five, five things that I believe create prisons for us. How many am I gonna give you? Five. Say five. five. Say I know they're gonna be good. <laughs> really good. Really good. All, five. All five. Okay. <laughs> five of them, I'm gonna give you five. And then I'm gonna give you some solutions to these five things that create these prisons because I don't think it'd be very good I come here and show you all the problems. There's enough problems out there. If I'm just showing you the problems that create prisons, I wanna give you some solutions as well. So the first thing that I believe creates a prison in our life, if you're taking notes, please write this word down, underline it, put a star beside it, is simply prejudice. It creates prisons. The word prejudice means to prejudge. 
And all of us are prejudiced. All of us. You have this thing built into you. It's a survival mechanism. It means every time you see something, you assess it as to whether it's a threat or not. I tell people all the time that there's three filters that things come through in your mind. You see things as things that will help you, things that will hurt you, or things that are irrelevant. Prejudice is a label we put on anything. Whether a person has the right education or not, whether a person comes from the right place or not, they speak the right language or not, right? The color of their skin, color of their hair, whether they have tattoos or not. How many times do you prejudge something? You guys prejudged me when I walked up here. You do. I bet it's gonna be like this. You heard Pastor Mike saying, this is who this guy is. You already had this idea. That's prejudice. Everybody talks about now, and I was sharing this morning with, with Earl, everybody talks about you know, being woke, and that's the term, it's woke. And, and, and I read something the other day that I thought was profound. It said, being half woke is dangerous because all you see is that you have one eye open, you see certain things that you would judge as bad. But if you open both eyes, you see that things are also really good. You have to be able to see both, but sometimes when we prejudge something, we just see it as a certain way, and then that's it. And it can lock us into a prison. We don't even know why we do it. We wanna stay safe. Thank God your parents stayed safe. Your grandparents stayed safe long enough to reproduce your family, right? Think about that. It's important, but we gotta be careful with it. Prejudice puts you in a prison, prejudging something before you even know. And it's not just other people. You can prejudge you. You can be prejudiced towards you because of where it is that you think you were from or how your family was or how much education you had and didn't have. That's prejudice. You can be prejudiced towards yourself. How many of you get angry at yourself sometimes? Raise your hand. Come on. How many, how many of you can be very critical of you sometimes? Come on. Yes. And it's very, it's very easy to go to uh, this intensity towards you. My wife told me after first service, she's like, babe, this is great, loved it. She said, but don't forget to smile. <laughs> I said, sure. <laughs> soon as she said, babe, don't forget to smile, soon as she got out of her mouth, I was like, well, baby. <laughs> but when you start being prejudiced towards you, there's this intensity and an energy that you can carry, that you're so critical of yourself. It's okay to critique yourself. We say there's a big difference between a critical eye and a critical heart. If you're not careful, that criticism of you move into your heart, take you over, now you're so prejudiced towards you, you don't even like you. It's like sometimes you gotta give yourself a little bit of a break. A little bit of a break. That's why I said before we started service, maybe you need to pat yourself on the back and say, hey, I'm here. I made it. This is the start, but I'm here. Second thing that, that can become a prison to us that a lot of times people don't understand is one that was big for, for me, and that was proximity. Proximity. It can create a prison. You can be in prison to the proximity that you allow yourself to have with other people, and the next thing you know, you've surrounded yourself with people that aren't really for you. Does it? What's the old saying? Birds of a feather, what? But they also arrive at the same destination. You have to be very careful of who you allow around you. Proximity. I said in first service, I'll say it again. Um, I'm very careful about who I give proximity to when it comes to my family. One of the things that I said was the greatest gift I've given myself was to kill the TV in my house. And it, 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 we don't watch it. I like, will watch some movies and stuff like that, but I'll tell you this, I hadn't seen the news in a long time. Old saying, I've heard many people say it, right? If you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. If you do watch the news, you're misinformed. You think I'm gonna let some crazy person in my house you think I'm gonna let somebody in my house go mess with my kid's head, mess with my wife's mind? When I met my wife 17 years ago, 
guy that ordained me, ordained me into ministry, married my wife. He said, Ronnie Doss, he said, you have one job when you marry your wife. He said, protect her heart. She's uncorrupted, keep her that way. I don't let drama in my house. I don't. It might sound like I'm like, I don't let drama in my house. Like, no, I don't do that. That's drama in and of itself. I just stand guard the gate. And if you look like drama, I'll pick you off 30 yards out. If you look like you're gonna bring something, an agenda into my house that I don't think is going to help us do what it is that we are doing, I'll take you out 30 yards out. You won't even get that close because I know proximity can be a prison. Some of you need to look at that because you got people around you who might be steering you in the wrong direction. Proximity. Say, that's a problem because it is. And you guys know, sometimes you know. I'm not saying you got to be prejudiced. I just told you. That could be its own prison, but you do need to assess the relationships that you have and say, I don't think this one's going to help me get where it is that I need to go, the best place that I know I'm supposed to wind up. Because proximity, wrong relationships bring a tear to your eye. They'll bring you to tears. They won't bring you to your destiny. Say proximity. Here's the third thing. This one may be the most profound that when I got it and really started to understand it, I started to be so careful and so intentional about this one because this one idea and the idea is that we like to be right. We like to create certainty. So we're very afraid. We can be nervous and very fearful. And so what we do is this third thing that creates prisons is we create predictions. So prejudices, proximity. The third prison is predictions. I heard someone say this. They said, when you lay in the bed and you wake up in the morning and you're already down and you're depressed and you're frustrated and you haven't even gotten out of bed, it's because you've aligned with a prediction that you think your day is gonna be filled with negativity, hurt, rejection. You think somebody's not gonna value you, appreciate you. You think, right, you've got this prediction going, and that story runs in your mind over and over again. You have aligned with a prediction, and now that prediction has you in a prison. Does that make sense? I wanna make sure I'm clear on that, because when I started going, okay, what am I predicting for today? I started to understand some of why I felt how I felt. And I shared this with the staff yesterday as I was working with the team. I said, look, seeing is believing, but feeling is reality. You can see something, but until it makes you feel something that's not very real for you, you can lay in the bed in the morning. You can already be depressed about the day because you've predicted how it's going to go. A prediction can become a prison. Say, that's a problem. Here's the fourth thing that can become a prison. And that is praise. Now some of you are like, what? We were just in here doing some praise and some worship. That's good. I'm not talking about praising your creator. I'm talking about being in the prison to the praise of those that are your peers. When I work with teams all the time, I say, listen to me. If you live for applause, you will die when it gets quiet. And so much of success and growth and moving from this level to the next means that you can handle it when it's quiet. I came up with this quote the other day. I thought it was profound. Is it okay that I say I think my own thinking sometimes is profound? Sometimes I think, man, this is stupid. Sometimes I'm like, it's pretty good. You guys ever done that before? You're like, that's ain't too bad. It's ain't too bad. I had this idea the other day that you could get 10,000 likes on social media and it will not fix your dislike of you. And so when I become desperate for someone to applaud me, desperate. You ever seen somebody who just seemed to be very desperate for attention? 
Desperation makes you invisible to the thing that you're running after. Do you understand? Desperate. Some of you say, well, I'm just so desperate for God. Well, listen, God is already there. You don't need to be desperate. Do you understand what I mean? Like sometimes you gotta stop begging, start declaring. Because it's there, you know what I mean? Pastor Mike said it after first service. He said, I hope that you feel that you got some new things in your tool bag. I tell people that all the time. I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna give you just a few tools, but you have to be willing to take it back to the job site and do the work. When you're desperate and needy, it can make you invisible. Praise is one of these things locks us up. Last thing. This can create prisons. Hope you guys writing this stuff down. I know, I know. Some of you are like, well, I'll just go back and watch it online. Okay, I think you should take some notes. Never know, you ever read something before that you wrote before, had written before, and you didn't see something, but you went back to it, and you're like, oh, wow. You ever done that? Had somebody give me a book years ago. I read it for a little bit. I was like, this ain't for me. And then for some reason picked it up a few years later. I was like, oh, man. Last thing is create prison, is promises. And that's where you're agreeing to too many things. It can become a prison. Have you guys ever been somewhere where they asked you to go on a trip with them or asked you to go out to dinner with them or asked you to do something and you were feeling good in the moment and you agreed to it? And then when that, you flip the calendar <laughs> and you look and you're like, oh, that's this weekend, we're supposed to go do that? And then you don't, you ever done that before? So how many of you ever done that before? It becomes a prison, you make too many promises, that's what I'm talking about. These things are prisons. Look at my life. Have I been in prison? Am I in prison? Where am I in prison? And these things are big for me. And so I told you I'd give you some solutions on this. Here's the insight I wanna share with you. When I read this passage of scripture and it says an angel showed up, to me I was thinking, okay, outside the spiritual context of it, what could this angel represent? You know what I landed on? The angel was an idea. Because it said when the angel showed up, the light started to shine. Have you guys ever heard that song? You say like this, I saw the light, I saw the light. Y'all know that song? Some of you are like, no, that's stupid. It don't even sound good. Oh, hey, 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 hey. But what we say sometimes, we get an idea. What we say, light came on. It says the angel shows up, and all of a sudden, there's light. Boom. It says the chains fell off. Do you know an idea can pull you out of the prison that you've been in for a long time? Just one idea. That's why I'm very passionate about this stuff. My wife said, hey, don't forget to smile, because sometimes, like, I'm passionate about what it is that I share. I've had people tell me that. I'll leave a conference, do something, like, Ryan, you're so passionate about what you share. I'm like, I know these ideas, these concepts have helped me to transform my life. Yes, I'm very passionate about it. One idea can change everything. One idea. You think the idea of what Amazon could be didn't change Jeff Bezos' life? The idea of creating cars like Tesla, Elon Musk, you think that hadn't changed his life? You think Windows, Bill Gates, that didn't change his life? One idea, one idea can change everything. To me, when I read the passage, I'm like, oh, yes, it was an angel, but maybe the angel brought an idea. And Peter was just willing to follow it for a minute. Some of them say, man, that's what I want to do. Got a new idea, go for it for just a second. But in the passage, it says that he followed it out, that Gates open for them that were there. It says they pass the guards, like things. An idea keep pulling you towards something. That's what this passage represented to me, was an idea. So can I give you some ideas or some insights around the five things that create prisons, some ideas and some insights that I think could pull us out? You guys open to that? If I give you the five solutions to it, what, what would I be if I was the guy that came and just talked to you about prisons, didn't talk to you about how to get out? Some people are good at that. Well, this is a problem. Everybody knows the problem. Maybe you're the problem. No, 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 everybody else is the problem. Well, we say if John has a problem with Sue, and John has a problem with Larry, and John has a problem with Ronnie, maybe John is the problem. Some people are great at pointing the finger saying this is the problem. I know there's problems. 
There's problems everywhere. If you don't solve problems, they become predicaments. So I got some solutions to each of these problems. Fair enough? Is that good? Say, that's good. You want it? Say, I want it. There you go. Let me give you these. These are five ideas that can counter these things that put us in prison. First things first, prejudice, right? That thing puts us in prison. The idea that I have that solves that so that you're not prejudiced is simply gratitude. Like I see something different in you, instead of judging it, I appreciate it. I say, oh, I'm, I'm glad this person is different. Can you imagine if we were all the same? All of us, all of us, the same? How boring would that be? What if all of us had to wear red shoes like these all day? <laughs> what if we all had to wear red shoes? It'd get boring after, I mean, I know these fine right now, these cool. Like, I like them red shoes. My wife said, wear them red shoes. I like them red shoes. I said, okay. She said, smile. I'm smiling. Smiling and red shoes. Two for two. Who knows how the day could go? It's good. Got my shoes on. What if all of us had to wear red shoes? It'd get boring quick, wouldn't it? We all pulled for the same sports team. Boring. Instead of prejudging the thing that looks different and being so locked on to your preference, maybe you should just be grateful for the differences. Maybe there's an opportunity for each of us every time we see something that is different instead of being prejudiced towards it saying, man, I'm grateful that that looks the way that it looks because maybe this thing is offering me an opportunity to learn something. Instead of judging it, maybe I could just be grateful for it. Maybe the problem that I say I have, the thing that I say I'm hating on, maybe I could just be grateful for it. Just a little shift, that idea this week, somebody came to me and said, look, when I start seeing some of the stuff that I'm seeing that I want to judge at work, someone said this to me, after first service, when I start to judge it, I'm just going to say, you know what, I'm grateful for it. And it's amazing what happens when you start to say, hey, this thing that I used to believe was such a problem, maybe it's trying to show me something. Maybe it's trying to show you something. If you get one thing from today's message, maybe you say, that thing that I have judged that I say I hate so bad Maybe, just maybe, it's trying to show me something. I did a corporate training, and, I, and I'll tell you this, and, and I normally don't share this, but I know the lady that, that, that this encounter happened with, I know she wouldn't mind. I did a corporate training, and we were talking about some things. This lady raises her hand, and she says, you know what? She said, <clears throat> She said, I'm carrying some energy on some stuff. And I said, what is it? And she said, it's my mom. Like she's so judging her mother. And just so you know, prejudice means prejudge. You just keep judging something. She said, I'm carrying some judgment on my mom. I said, well, what is it? She said, my mother never told me she loved me. So, okay. I said, well, what have you done with it? And she said, well, she said, because my mom didn't tell me that she loved me, I wanted to make sure that everybody that was in my circle, anybody that I worked with on my team, here in my job, any of my coworkers, any of my family, that they would know that I loved them and I accepted them and I would say it and I would tell them. They would know. I said, fantastic. I said, who in this room has been really impacted by this lady's willingness to love you and to serve and to be kind and to encourage you over the years. I said, who's been impacted? And immediately all the hands, I'm not talking about like a, well, yeah, kind of. I got the, I looked at her, I said, you see all these hands? She said, yes. I said, look at the gift your mother gave you. What you're hating on is maybe one of the greatest blessings of your life. And I'm not saying that we go, oh, now I don't tell people that I love them because maybe I'm trying to give them some blessing. But it can be both. You can tell people that you love them and encourage them, but you can also serve them just so that they know they matter to you and they mean something in your life. I listened to something Pastor Mike said, and it stuck with me. And he said he was during the service, and he said he did this, this message on connecting people and getting past some things, and he said that he challenged you guys, his family, said to text somebody and say, hey, can we talk? 
And that stuck with me. I've shared that with many people, Pastor Mike. It's like, hey, can we chat for a minute? Because when you text that to somebody, guess what's going to happen? They'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 Ooh, what's wrong? We what talk, you know, can we chat? <laughs> and sometimes we just need to let people know, stop being so prejudiced. Stop judging at all. Just be grateful. The moment you start to judge, you say, hey, I'm grateful for that. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself, not listen to yourself. Tell yourself, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. Starts to change those neural pathways. Way out of the prison of prejudice is gratitude. The second one, this is a big one, told you for me it was big. The prison of proximity, the way you get out of that prison is simply to become the person that you would like to have around you. So instead of complaining about all the people that you would say around you that aren't doing it right, what your focus is is not on them and how they're not doing it. Your focus is on who it is that you need to become to have the people in your life that you think are valuable. I tell people all the time, we complain a lot about not getting invited to the table, but we got to ask ourselves, what are we bringing to the table anyway? If I'm doing a corporate training, which I do all the time, I tell people, I'm like, hey, don't ask something of the team that you're not willing to bring yourself. Don't ask anything of your spouse, your family, your kids that you aren't willing to bring. I can't ask my kids to pay attention to the details if I won't pay attention to details. I can't tell my kids, pay attention, if I don't pay attention. I can't ask them to be kind even when you don't feel like it. If I'm not working on myself to be kind, I'm trying to become the person that I need to be to attract the right people into my life. And what I have found, guys, is when I stopped looking out there so much and started looking in here, the right kind of people showed up in my life. And I was sticky enough to cause them to want to walk with me. I got some great mentors and some friends that believe in me, and they're much older than me. Two of my closest friends, one of my closest mentors, the guy that if I have a question, if there was something I needed to know, I'd call him. He's 30 years older than me, and we're tight. I love him all the way, but he helps me all the time. I say, Ronnie, you gotta live in the question. Ask yourself how you can be better. Don't worry so much about what everybody else is doing. That'll fix the proximity problem if you will become the best version of you. You will look up. Somebody say, well, it's lonely at the top. I don't think so. I think the higher you go on doing better and thinking better, there are people that will show up and so you want to solve the problem of proximity. You say, well, there's not enough good people around me. Become the person that you want to have around you. Practice that. People will show up. Third thing that's a prison. What I say is predictions. Here's the solution to predictions. Ready? If I give it to you, would you just listen to this one thing? If I give you this one thing, can I give you this? How many of you have laid in the bed in the morning, not want to take your day on, already down, already worried, already anxious? How many of you ever woke up before your feet hadn't hit the ground, but you're already in prediction mode? How many of you have ever done that and felt bad because of it? Here's the solution to that. The solution to prediction is to stand in possibility, which means I think I know, but I have no idea. If I'm feeling like, man, today's going to be rough. I know it's not going to be good. I say, well, wait a minute. What's the possibility? Today could be great. My whole life could change. Meet one person, one phone call, one email. You never know. So I'm just going to stay in it, stand in possibility. We say it all the time. There's scripture that says, with God, all things are what? Possible. That means both of us. That means us and the creator. It means we both got to do our part. Sometimes we got to get past the prediction of saying, I know how my team's going to be. I know how my, my coworkers are going to act. I know how my kids are. I know how my, my, I know how my family's going to be. I know how the in-laws are going to be. I know how my friends are going to act. Like we're so in prediction mode, we become addicted to the feeling that we call ourselves. It's an addiction. Mike was talking about celebrate recovery. Like, and, and Pastor Mike said, Pastor Mike said, sometimes you gotta recover from your old self. Like, you can become addicted to you, meaning you know how you feel, and when you don't feel the way you think you always feel, you'll do anything to get that feeling back. Like, I usually don't feel good about my day, but right now, I'm feeling pretty good about my day, but since I don't usually feel like my day, 
feel good about my day. Let me go find something that I can be sure about, that I know is a prediction that's gonna cause me to feel what I used to feel so I get the shot in the arm of me. That ain't possibility. That's prediction. If you say, well, this is where I'm from. I didn't have any education. This is it. And you predict that your future is gonna be average because of where you've been, just know that what you look for, you always find. You're that powerful. The solution to a prediction is to stand in possibility. Today could be possibly the greatest day I've ever had. When I leave here today, I can learn something new about myself. I've had so many phone calls and so many things that have changed my life over the past, really seven, eight years that now I stand in possibility. I got a phone call from NASA. NASA asked me if I would be a part of the conversation of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter, what was going on there. They asked me to be a voice in that with the department heads at NASA. NASA, in one of the most important conversations they've probably ever had, and you're calling me to ask me to be the voice in it? I'm like, man. Why would they call me? And then I went, man, who else would they call? <laughs> now I'm expecting the phone to ring. Somebody say, hey, come support us, help us. Can you give us some stuff? I'm expecting that. I'm standing in the possibility. Yes. It's not where you start. It's not. It's where you finish. And I just tell you, I'm not done yet. I'm standing in possibility. Next thing I said was a prison. Next thing is prison. Is praise. The prison of praise is needing other people to tell you, you look nice, you look good, you're doing it right, you're okay, you're so loved, all that stuff. Like needing it, it's okay, but you need it so bad, you're locked on to everybody else's praise. The idea that I got to fix that in my life, to help me with that was, hey, stop looking for the praise from everybody else. Here was the solution, the idea I had. Just learn to encourage yourself. You wouldn't believe the plane rides I've been on. I've been on thousands of flights, thousands of flights. I've been all over the place. And there have been times where I've stepped away from doing an event where people didn't seem to respond to me. They just looked at me like I was crazy. I'm sharing the things that I know are scratching on these lenses and these perspectives and these prejudices and all these things that we all have. Like the human condition is tough. I'm scratching on those things and people just kind of like look at me sometimes like I'm crazy because I think maybe I'm hitting these things in them, this nerve, but I get on the airplane and I feel so alone. Like I think maybe you blew it. Maybe you had an opportunity to go and impact somebody's life and move them forward and help them to see something they couldn't see. Ronnie, maybe you blew it. Because maybe I was looking for praise from someone other than me. And when I didn't get it, I felt alone. And so one of the ideas that I came to many years ago was Ronnie Doss, encourage yourself. Encourage yourself. That doesn't mean to be delusional and to tell yourself all this stuff and be so positive all the time that you can't see something for what it is, but at some point you gotta be able to say, hey look, the change that I want to happen, it's in the mirror, so I'm gonna speak to the person in the mirror and I'm gonna say, you can do this, you can do it. Shh, just shut up if you're so negative, you can do it. And over time, you learn to encourage yourself, not being addicted to the praise of other people, not being Right, in that prison, I'm telling you, things start to change. You stop looking for the light and you start being the light. You speak to the light in you and the ideas of who you can become, those things start to get higher and higher and higher. The solution to needing the praise is to learn to encourage yourself. And I promise you, as you learn to do that really well, there'll be plenty of people telling you all the time how much they appreciate what you've done. And it'll be wonderful, but that'll all be supplemental to the fundamental thing that you know how to encourage you. My life changed when I started talking to me. I'm like, you don't have to encourage me all the time. I'll sit down with myself, talk to myself, and encourage myself. Last thing I said was 
a prison for us. That was promises. And the solution, the idea that I got on making so many promises, this is what came to me, it's what I was reflecting on as I was putting this together. Instead of making all these promises to all these people, for me, what I have found is not falling into that prison of all these promises and these agreements. For me, the idea that I think we need to hear today, some of you need to hear this, is to learn to say no and set some boundaries. Hear me on this, saying no. I, I tell companies, success starts with a yes. It's maintained with a lot of no's. You can't be everything to everybody or you're nobody. Like, you can't be that to everybody. Stop. I know what my brand is. I know who Ronnie Doss is. I don't have to spend tons of money on marketing. Marketing can get people's attention, but it's consistency and depth that keeps them coming back. You build a brand, you don't have to talk about it, you build it. And you do that by saying no to all these other things. I'm a car guy, I am. I'm a car guy, I like cars, it's okay. Got a nice car, bought me a nice car recently, like cars, that's okay. I'm in my car a lot, I can do coaching sessions with a team from my car, got me a little office on wheels, it's pretty cool. Some people say, I don't like my office. Well, if I don't like my office, I just drive my office across town and find something to look at that I do like. I'm a car guy. There's a guy named Enzo Ferrari. You guys ever heard of Ferrari? Yeah. They didn't make that many. He knew who he was. He didn't try to make the cheapest car in the whole world. He said, this is what we're going to create. He knew his brand. He built it. It's iconic now because he said no to a lot of things. In your life, build your brown, build your life. The solution to all these promises is to learn to say no and know that it's okay to say, hey, that's not for us. I can love you from a distance. I don't have to hang with you all the time. I can send you the best. I have boundaries. I'll tell you no quick. Somebody call, ask me, say, hey, can you come speak for us? This is what we want? And I know that that's not who I am? I say no. No. The church has asked me to come talk. Some of them I know, know the pastors, know the, know the culture. I say, no, not for me. Schedule's booked. And it is booked. It's booked with lots of things that I've said yes to. And that's not everything. No should be your weapon. You want it? Nope. You want to come? Nope. You think you'll? Nope. I'm good. I've been around some people very influential, created some really, really great things, and I can tell you, they used the word no like it was a scalpel with a surgeon. They cut things out of their life that didn't belong in their life. They say no, no, no. Some of you need to learn to say no and be okay with it. I tell people a lot, you don't know somebody until you've told them no. You a yes person just running around, yes, 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 yes. Yes, they're like, oh, I love you so much. Then you say, nope, not doing that. You'll find out whether they really like you or not. <laughs> say no. Some of you didn't say no. Way to go. You're already doing it. You ain't got to do everything you're told. Say no to saying no. That's fine. Do whatever. Please hear me. And by the way, if I don't say something about this, I didn't say it first service. We do have resources out there, resource table. I tell everybody what you hear time and time again becomes your truth. I got great resources out there, CDs you can take with you. One of the things I didn't mention from the platform the first time is so much of our coaching and so much of our content is online. We have one program. It's a $500 program. We sell it all the time. It's a corporate training, mindset training. We call it Essentials. If you come out to the product table and you purchase a CD set for $40, you can take these CDs with you. It's coaching, it's all this stuff. You also get this $500 video program. We're gonna give you this little slip of paper. You can go to my website, log in, use a promo code, and there's about four hours of me talking about concepts that I know are essential for us if we wanna to get to the next level. That's what we'll give you. I guess it's 40 bucks. But know this. There's work to be done for every one of us. <laughs> there's so much work to do. And that shouldn't fatigue us, it should inspire us. It shouldn't make you tired knowing there's so much work to do. It should motivate you. 
I had a great mentor that instilled so many of these principles into my life. He passed away. I worked with him for four and a half years. Great blessing in my life. But I feel like now I have a responsibility to him to keep going and keep sharing the message and keep becoming. It's a responsibility I have. We all have that to someone. We have a responsibility to make this world better, not to sit back and say, oh, it's going to hell in a handbasket. That might be fine, it could be true, but I ain't gotta buy it, I can do something about it. I can be a solution. I'm not waiting, I'm not letting somebody else determine how I do my life. I'm stepping in, I'm stepping up, and I'm getting after it. And I wanna challenge every one of you sitting in here today, whether you're online, you're in this room, that you say there's work to do and I'm gonna do it. And I'm not quitting till I get there. If you look at these five things I shared with you today, they can be tools, like Pastor Mike says, for your toolbox. When you get to work, open the toolbox. Say, this week I'm gonna use this one and I'm gonna create a life that at the end of it I'm gonna look back and I'm gonna be proud of because I owe it to some people. I owe it to God. I owe it. And I'm not stopping until I get there. Amen. If you'll do that, I promise you, we can change the way the world is right now. We can change it. We can do it. It's up to us. If it ain't gonna be us, who's it gonna be? If it ain't gonna be now, when's it gonna be? We can do it. So let's get to work. I love you guys. God bless you. Awesome. Woo. The thing I love about that passage that Ronnie shared today is that the angel of the Lord appeared into the prison cell, opened the door, set him free. The spiritual battle was won by the Lord. But the thing that God did not do was pick Peter up and walk him out of the prison. Peter had to get himself up, stand on his own two feet, and follow after the door that was opened. Follow after the, the exit, the freedom that God created for him. So many times we're stuck in our confirmational biases, the prejudices, and, and, and the, the no, I just know the predictions and we're looking for confirmation of why things are so bad when the door to your freedom is right in front of your face and the Spirit of God is saying to you every day, get up, arise from your slumber, arise from your sleep, see that it is here. I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, I'm looking at 2021 totally different. I literally believe that 2021 is gonna be a year of freedom and victory. Not because of any one man, not because of any political party, but because of opportunity, because of renewed vision from people being tired of the way it was to what could be this year. I'm just gonna throw something out. I don't really care what side of the coin you fall on about this possible $3 trillion stimulus, people who are ticked off about it. I'm just gonna say, if you're so ticked off about it, then when you get the money, send it back. If you ain't gonna send it back, then shut up. Okay, if you're gonna spend it and go buy red shoes, Hey, now the anointing's here. <laughs> but what could be, what's a possibility that could be with our economy stimulated? Follow the light. Follow an idea. Ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom over your finances. Ask for wisdom that everything you set your hands to would prosper and be successful. Ask him for creative and innovative ideas. How can we take our businesses and our families and our lives to the next level in 2021? Lord, give us a renewed vision in our lives. If you will do that, instead of being the victim, take responsibility, this could be your year. This could be the year you've been praying for. And, and, and it could come on the heels of probably the worst year of your life. Maybe what the enemy meant for evil, God is going to use for his glory. And I'm telling you, he put the gift in you. He put the answer in you. You are the answer. Amen? Father, we thank you for today. 
We thank you for a word in season that would ignite us, supercharge us, energize us to have a vision for this year. I pray, Holy Spirit, that everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. Lead us, guide us, direct us into all truth. Open the eyes of our understanding. Enlighten us to that truth. Let us see things to come. Let us see opportunities. Let us seize the opportunities of a lifetime in the lifetime of the opportunity. Help us to be the answer to those in need. Help us to be the answer to solving problems at hand. I thank you, Lord, that we are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Offering baskets are at the door, and Ronnie's table's right in the back.